mess with some settings this morning. But yeah. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Welcome <clears throat> to Microbiology Journal. Welcome to Microbiology Journal. Journal Club, where we let out big about all things small. <laughs> um, my name is Faz, and uh, I work as a research integrity specialist. We're here to talk about microbiology. That's just that's the, that's our new like kind of short <laughs> short intro. I'm here to talk, talk, like <laughs> absolutely. Like microbiology. You like microbiology. Let's talk about microbiology. <laughs> absolutely. And and I was saying that this week we have like a real smorgasbord of things uh, coming through. Uh, and as always, we're opening up with, I guess, like more current news things. And last uh, two weeks ago, someone brought up the polio outbreak or like uh, some potential rumblings, right, about uh, polio prevalence inside of New York State. Um, and so, uh, Faz, you found this M Morbidity Mortality Weekly report, which really is like the CDC's premier like update on what's going on. Um, and, and this particular report is about that, that the polio case, that I think, brought the news attention to it. Yeah, uh, so this is looking at uh, a case of polio where mm -hmm. I think it was in June 2022 where a young adult with like a, a five day history of like low grade fever, neck stiffness, back and abdominal pain, uh, they were hospitalized, hospitalized with uh, what is they call acute flaccid myelitis. So they had a lot of like extreme like muscle weakness. Mm. Um, <clears throat> they did, yeah, and they did some tests and they found that uh, they were positive for polio. Yes, and specifically, it's this like um, vaccine-derived polio virus strain is what they what they titled it. Um, and so, like, I think that that's pretty interesting. I we didn't really touch on it, but the in the discussion of this paper, they have a paragraph that like gives a bit of an overview that there are different types of polio vaccines out there, <laughs> and the U.S. specifically uses this inactivated polio vaccine. So that's like where they take the uh, polio uh, viruses and they like use formaldehyde or they use like some funny cross link chemicals to sort of could, could be heat. I didn't look into which one the US uses, but then it, it kills those viruses. So they're not active anymore. Their proteins are kind of like maybe stuck in a certain state or something like this, but they're still immunogenic. And then that helps us make antibodies towards it. And so that in the 2000s, that has been, since the 2000s, that's been the only polio vaccine used in the States. But um, I guess through the history of polio vaccination, there have been many different types of polio vaccines. Like at one point in history, I guess there still is, like there's been a concerted effort to create lots of different vaccines so that we could remove polio, like eradicate polio, right? That was a, a World Health Organization initiative. Um, I guess this news is kind of on the bat, like people, this is like kind of the sad news of the situation is that like, uh, because of decreasing vaccination rates, like that, that effort to eradicate polio seems to be hitting like a plateau of some sort. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so this VDPV is actually a polio strain that can be found. It's a, in a vaccine strain uh, can pick up mutations in the population and then uh, end up causing polio in unvaccinated individuals. <clears throat> yeah, and I think it's quite interesting that it is a vaccine derived, but since we don't get ODP, the, the, the uh, active, so they don't know where this vaccine derived strain, um, so they know it came from a vaccine derived strain, mm -hmm. but there, is, there isn't really many opportunities for that to happen in the U.S. Yeah, it's all killed vaccines, so right. there must be some international travel coming from the place that do use like the live vaccines. So exactly I think one of the reasons why they they use live vaccines because you don't need to refrigerate it as much. And mm -hmm. It's not easy to give to people because I think you just like drop it onto like a sugar cube and give it to people. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, I think the other thing is that that vaccine strain <clears throat> helps prevent transmission a little bit more. Because like, I guess the way that you get it, right, we've talked about this before, like the mucosal immunity versus the, um, versus like systemic, like flowing through your blood immunity. Um, and like, I think that there's something about that oral polio vaccine that does help reduce transmission a little bit more. And, and they make the point of saying in the discussion that this inactivated polio vaccine does not reduce intestinal infection and transmission in that way. So it's kind of interesting, like if you're vaccinated with this inactivated polio vaccine, you're not gonna get serious disease, but you could still be carrying polio virus inside of your gut in some ways. Um, and so then it makes, a, 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 and this is like sort of the, the news, right, of, of this particular outbreak is there's some community spread of 
of polio in in unvaccinated communities and probably even in vaccinated communities, right? Like, because if you're vaccinated, you're just not getting the serious disease part of it. Um, and so the report is trying to highlight the danger there uh, within unvaccinated communities that polio could uh, cause disease there. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's a lot of this paper that's dedicated to them trying to try and find where they got this polio, mm -hmm. this polio disease from. Mm -hmm. So they looked at the, the patient attended like a large gathering eight days before they got the symptoms. Yeah. Oh. So they checked the people at that gathering. They couldn't. Really I was going to say, scr scr scroll us to the figure. Figure. I guess the only figure in this thing is like a little timeline they have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. That, so, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and they couldn't really find any specific person who seemed to have that. Mm -hmm. um, so and then they turned to wastewater samples to see if there is community spread, then you might see evidence of it in wastewater. And I think this has been used for SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, I think they even said that it was samples that were collected for SARS-CoV-2 surveillance, right. that they were just like, oh, we have these wastewater samples. Let's also run this through polio now that we know this might be emerging to try to get resolution on what's going on here. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think they, um, I think they might have found some. Let me double check. I don't. Mm, I think. I, I don't know if they trace it back to like some original thing, but they do see like it's it is in the wastewater. Me, like, that's sort of the that's the evidence they use to say that there's some community spread of some sort. Yeah, I think that because it didn't come out come from nowhere, so they know it's somewhere in the community, and then they kind of add in some extra information about how it seems to be spreading community in a community that has quite low vaccination rates against polio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That could be a factor. And, and I think there is better coverage on this week in virology. I think that was mentioned last week as well, yeah. right? That like, um, and, and they're like the host of that show, Vincent Racaniello, he is a polio virus virologist. So like, like there's some insight there that, that I think uh, people should check out if they're more interested. <clears throat> They never get sound issues. Gosh, damn it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So moving All on right. for us, um, the SARS-CoV-2 paper that we picked out for this week, I guess, isn't really like something super like immediate. <laughs> you know, I feel like the pandemic, um, well, I don't know, the pandemic news is being crazy, <laughs> I, I think. All these official statements of things being over, but like, you know, it's still going on. It's it's circulating around. And scientists, of course, are working on finding better resolution data to understand like how this virus really is interacting with all the systems in the body. Uh, and particularly in this paper, they're looking at developing pancreas. Um, so I, I was a bit curious like maybe part of this is that they have the ability to make these weird pancreatic organoids that are developing and so they're just uh, trying to see what information they can get using that model system but they do in the introduction they also make a, a statement saying that um, there is a link between diabetes potentially and SARS and, and COVID SARS-CoV-2 um, at least some epidemiological stuff saying that um, like rates of diabetes could be higher diabetes is definitely like a uh, a comorbidity that causes worse outcomes. Uh, so, you know, there is a reason to find this information for sure. Um, so you can imagine this might be, like whenever I see a model like this, I wonder like, where is it happening, right? In, in the actual human population. Um, and I guess the idea would be, this is like if pregnant mothers get infected with SARS-CoV-2, uh, it could go into the developing pancreas there, or maybe even kids at some point, right? Um, like they have, like they're still developing in some ways. Like maybe some of those cells um, could be susceptible in this particular way. And and I guess you could imagine too that like just growing pancreas might have these sort of cells, right? That are like differentiating into pancreatic cells of some sort. Um, so yeah, so they 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 grow up these. Uh, cell culture pancreas balls essentially, right? Like <laughs> cells. Uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, human pluripotent stem cells. Uh, they, they turn them into the, the progenitors of pancreas cells, and then those go on and they develop into full-on pancreatic cells, uh, organoid style. Um, and they infect those with SARS-CoV-2, and they find out some different molecular factors that play a role in that. Um, is there anything you want to do? You want to say something else I mean, about I this? Think this paper is quite... Quite interesting in terms of looking at the direct molecular factors, not mm -hmm. necessarily 
in a way that we can because I think the extrapolation for humans that's going to be quite a a difficult because these are like grown in vitro. But yeah. I think the strength of this is on how they look at like the endocytosis pathway for this. So they they look at the main things that are, that play big roles in entry. So yeah. ACE two, TMPRS S two, and they also look at N NRP one, which I think we've talked about a little bit. Where yeah, uh, like it, if it gets cleaved in a certain way, it exposes the peptides that allows SARS CoV two to to fuse. Um, right. It's another. It like there's all that we always talk about the ACE two. That's that's definitely dominated the discussion because that's the main spike protein receptor but yeah we had talked about it briefly before that there's another receptor that exists on cell types and and there's like there's an observation right that just having high ace2 numbers isn't enough isn't doesn't always isn't always the main factor that drives whether a cell will be susceptible or not um and so yeah they're, they're also curious about NLR, nlrp2 in this system but i don't think they find evidence for nlr and NLRP2 being useful in this system, right, of, of, of developing pancreas cells. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we've picked, because NRP1, uh, that's been a lot more like kind of, it's a lot more newer. It's a, little, it's a much more newer discovery than the ACE2 TMPR SS2 thing. And mm -hmm. NRP1, it, there is a lot of questions on how it works. And it, because I think it's you need to explain how SARS-CoV-2 can go into like new, new neural cells that aren't necessarily That's right. expressing ACE2. Yeah, the name of that so, gene is neuropillin. <laughs> yeah, neuropillin. Yeah, neuropillin. Yeah, neuropillin mm -hmm. is, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so I think found it quite interesting that it didn't work in this model. Mm -hmm. Also, like the clarification of how the endocytosis pathway might be more important here, even though these these cells do express the ACE2 receptors. Again, yeah. Quite, yeah, yeah. So like that's that's that in this graphical summary that we're showing, that's that final entry. But I think if we go down to that, that is the one figure that I wanted to point people to, uh, which is it's like one of the last figures, really. Figure four. <clears throat> figure four, where I, we've seen this work before, they use a selection of different inhibitors. <laughs> Those inhibitors will inhibit either that early stage of uh, entry where TMPRSS2 is like doing the pre cleavage and like facilitating fusion at the membrane surface. Um, but then they also have another suite of inhibitors that work downstream from that, right, that are inhibiting uh, after endocy endocytosis of those um, viral particles, um, yeah, just fusing uh, in the endosome. And so, you know, with clever use or with using a suite of inhibitors over their particular cell type, they're able to show that in this system of their developing pancreatic cells, uh, the contribution of the endocytic is more important than than at the at the membrane fusion, which is that's and, and you know, we've talked about that before, too, with the variants, right? Like when Omicron has an importance on the endocytic fusion, right, more than the membrane side. And so, like, I guess that's also interesting, right? Like it gives us a little bit of. Uh, ways of talking about what the differences might be as we see variants change um, in in the ability for those viruses to enter different parts of uh, different tissues in, in our body. <laughs> yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to mm -hmm. pick up with this paper. Yep. And that's all of the sort of current virological outbreak news that we have for you. Uh, but the, and so the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, first inhuman assessment of safety and immunogenicity of low and high doses of plasmodium falciparum malaria protein uh, 013 <laughs> administered intramuscular, intramuscularly with ALFQ adjuvant in healthy malaria naive adults. Yeah, lot, this is interesting because uh, I'm quite interested in the malaria vaccines and their progress because I think a, lot, a couple last year I think there was a ma there's quite a big breakthrough mm -hmm. in, like a, in, a special adjuvant I think was what we covered last yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah the so a lot of the, these malaria out, malaria vaccines are based on the circumsporite circumsporozoite protein which mm -hmm. is kind of found on the surface of malaria during that stage of infection where Think it's tooling around like the liver and bloodstream um and and so like a lot of these vaccines are targeted to, towards that and the one that was in i think last october 2021 they the who looked at this vaccine called i think rts uh which was uh was found to be quite good for for, for protecting children against mm -hmm. a bit against malaria mm -hmm. um I think they did like phase three. I think the I'm trying to remember the paper recovery. I think it was like a phase three trial, and it had 
good, it stacked up to the old uh, vaccine, this new formulation with the new adjuvant was doing really well. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's the thing. They, they found that the new, the, the adjuvant was really important. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they, but they, they, these, this vaccine still isn't perfect. What they want to make sure is to have, that it has like long lasting coverage. And I think one thing they noticed is that there was like a decline effect in the antibody responses. Mm. And so this like new kind of malaria, malaria vaccine, they're focused on trying to make the the vaccine itself more like kind of uh, uh, noticeable by the immune system, mm -hmm. and they're using what they refer to as modern adjuvants. So the A, so they put something called the uh, Army Liposome formulation containing <laughs> QS21. Uh, That's the ALFQ. Yeah. Um, so this is their new kind of fancy adjuvant, which is based on like liposome technology. You may know liposomes from vaccines such as Moderna and uh, Pfizer. Uh huh. They're being used here. Because yeah. they but, be a good adjuvant in themselves. But but here, like they're not being used as a delivery mechanism in this no. circumstance. Because in, in the vaccines, like the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, like that's a delivery mechanism to get the 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 coding sequence for some antigen into your cells. Here it's being strictly used to, I guess, deliver something, a, a stimulus to the cells that's helping the immune response, I guess, um, become more active for the particular antigens that are being provided exter yeah, externally. <laughs> adjuvants are an important factor in like trying to communicate to the immune system what the th that, that something you're giving them is a threat and mm -hmm. the kind of threat it poses. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And so I think that these modern adjuvants are trying best to not just like, because I think in the old days they used to give an adjuvant just to make sure the immune system reacted, but now they're, the adjuvants are getting more focused on trying to make sure they have the right sort of reaction. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is very much a phase two study. So you, this isn't, you're not going to get treatment data out of it. You're not going to see like people in real world being like protected. This, the main thing here is to make sure that it's safe. Yeah. And to, to see if they can, it can accelerate those immune proxies for whether something's protected or not. So whether it can spike antibody responses, spike uh, T cells and other like polymorphic, polymorph PBMCs. I mm -hmm. don't know how to pronounce the full name. <laughs> um, uh, polynuclear mononuclear something. <laughs> yeah. Blood so blood cells, <laughs> BMCs, blood blood mononuclear cells. <laughs> yeah, the cells under the microscope that when you take a blood sample, they're not red. They've got the gloopy stuff in them. That's the cells. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I think that this yeah. So I think part of this is. Yeah, the, the liposomes is different, but inside the liposomes are the was the adjuvant that was used, right? Like in the in the study that we saw earlier. Yes. But they've also changed up the antigen in this particular formulation. Cause like I guess I don't remember what the <laughs> the antigen was that they used when we saw the last study, but this one they're saying is different. It's like they've chosen like a whole bunch of other segments of the CSP antigen and to, to try to see if they could get like, I guess, broader antibody coverage over over that particular target. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think they, they're all derived from the same pro protein, but they do try to iterate on it, trying mm -hmm. to create smarter kind of like, because every time you mess with the kind of sequence of, of, an, of the kind of vaccine yeah you really want to make sure that it's got high coverage from all the strains of of malaria mm -hmm. and that it can be something that the the immune system can react to mm -hmm. um i mean one thing that i kind of found interesting of this was like the actual like i mean this early on one of the funny things is the patients so this is a relatively small study mm -hmm. they only managed to get like seven people to do it and a lot they, were, they do tell stories about the draws which were quite funny which is like one person got hit by poison ivy, uh, and he couldn't do it because his immune system was reacting to everything. Another one got a hernia. Uh, another oh, one moved out of the, the moved out of state, and they couldn't track them down. Uh -huh. um, uh, <laughs> based on the people they got, it was they seem it seems to be quite positive news. Mm -hmm. and, and because they have so few people, they're able to dive in like sort of deeper into the. They they take antibodies from all of them, and they take as you said like. T cells or, or immune cells and try to see like whether the responses are working. And yeah, I guess it's promising. It's not da the most important thing in this level of study is it didn't cause any serious adverse reactions in the people that they tried. And they're able to sort of um, ramp up the dose. And, and, and there's no difference between right low dose and high dose uh, in terms of adverse events. 
yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the main thing they take out of the immunological data is if you give a high dose, the decline effect in antibodies is much lower. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the and the actual side effects aren't that different between the high high and low dose. So that is kind of a positive thing. So if they do a full clinical study on this, then they're probably going to go with a high dose mm -hmm. because it, and th that should be better a better way to kind of test out whether this vaccine works or not. Yeah, so now they have the parameters that they can do like a larger study and maybe bring in actual efficacy data in terms of are people going to get malaria, right? Like what's the reduction in people actually getting malaria once 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 this vaccine goes into into trial? Yeah. Cool. Uh, and yeah, now we've got like one of the more out there kind of papers. Uh-huh. Uh, Microbial biofilms for electricity generation from water evaporation and power to wearables. <laughs> yeah, just uh, really interesting stuff. I, I was looking just at some uh, biofilm, electrical biofilm stuff because of, well, I've always, I'm always interested in biofilms. It's like, you know, bacteria living together. Like, how do they cooperate in that matrix? What proteins are they making to help them cooperate? Um, and so there's this one system uh, Geobacter sulfur reductans, something. Um, it's a, it's an anaerobe, and uh, I think we may have covered it at some point, just very briefly. But it's become like the premier model system to sort of look at all these different electrical uh, elements within it, within bacteria, because inside of its biofilms, it makes sort of like conductive nano wires. Um, they have cytochromes that are yeah that become like these uh, long structures and then it can like move charges between places so that's that's one thing that's known but then the other thing that's known that that generates this paper is this bizarre phenomena where um if you have like a specific type of i guess high surface area uh surface <laughs> that's sitting on top of uh, a, vapor, a, a liquid interface, liquid air interface, and from that surface, stuff is evaporating, and I guess charges can move in that surface in some specific way, it creates a current, <laughs> it creates electri electrical current. And so uh, I guess the, the way that it's being discovered was like with nanomaterials, like, you know, specialized surfaces that have a very specific topography, probably graphene. I bet graphene's in there. I, I don't really know, but like, I think that that's, that's one of the ways they approach it. That can be used to harvest the electricity from evaporating water. And so this paper says, well, why don't we think about geobacter sulfur reductans like it has an interesting surface chemistry going on it can conduct stuff in its biofilm can it be used to create electricity from evaporating water and so they create like a rig where it has uh, electrodes gold electrodes they like cut up s slices of biofilm and they place them on the electrodes and uh, they're able to power this little hello world <laughs> lcd screen um, off of the current generated <laughs> Yeah, it's very cool. Like, like, um, because they they talk about other 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 materials they use. So naturally, they started off with say, I think semi. I think they started with like, as I think semiconductors. They did silicon nanowires. I think they definitely did uh, graphene or something like that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> they basically talk about like the kind of power density that they can fit into that. So, so mm. in functionalized carbon, it's uh, a na nanowatt per centimeter squared, and then. For a silicon nanowire, it goes up by a magnitude of a thousand to be a microwatt per centimeter squared. Mm -hmm. And then they start, start looking at biomaterials like wood, because they have like porous structures that have a lot of surface area. To, and the idea is like these, the energy of this, it, this process is derived from like the, the water evaporating. As it evaporates, it kind of moves a charge around. Mm -hmm. And that, that charge can uh, create the energy that ends up powering the device. So, um, yeah, the paper, they have this idea of like putting these giant film thin films onto like uh, kind of reservoirs and using that to power it's almost <laughs> like solar power through other means. Um, yeah, and and so they're thinking of like how organic materials can get a lot of surface area, and these biofilms can get even more surface area. Plus, they've got this other like kind of unknown factor: the fact that geo geobacter self reducens has these cytochromes because I think in nature. It has this really amazing crossfeeding strategy where, like, mm -hmm. it lives anaerobically and it shares its like respiratory chain with other bacteria, so that when it so when it reduces sulfur, it doesn't create oxygen. It it kind of like pipes that energy up to other bacteria in the community where they do the other parts of the um, 
the reaction. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's using those nanowires to do like long range electron transfer, so you could get electrons into a new micro environment, and in that environment, other bacteria are growing and and pick those things up and use it for their own purposes. Um, yeah, it's it's a really cool model in that sense. Um, but this paper is very engineering focused, I would say. <laughs> like it's sort of saying like, so like knowing all of this, how do you make a thing that you could actually get some current off of? <laughs> yeah. They they do like laser patterning on it. So they take these biofilms and they pat pattern them and treat them like a material. Because I think one of the things that this paper focuses on is they, because I think geosol bacteria has been used in batteries. And one of the things mm -hmm. that are pain in the ass with microbial batteries, you have to keep the microbes alive. Yeah. You keep feeding them otherwise in order for them to keep energy. Mm -hmm. And here they're saying, okay, let's just like not do that. Let's just like take whatever the bacteria make throw out the bacteria, where then you have to worry about feeding them and yes. see what you can do with that. Yes, and I think it is also unique to that mechanism. Like again, I, I'm not quite, I don't quite understand this mechanism of making electricity, but it's tied to that fact that the energy from this cell, it's not coming from the bacteria per se, right? Or any metabolism that's going on. It's coming from the evaporation of water from the surface and they call it streaming, electron streaming phenomena, right? So that phenomena is what's driving the electrical creation. And that phenomena is based on the physical properties of whatever the water's evaporating from. So like, I think they mentioned like, it needs like some, you know, mobile charges, some like hydrophobic, something like this, right? Like it's about, it's about the, the chemical properties, the physical properties of that. And uh, yeah, so maybe these biofilms do it. They do it really well. They make these tiny little cells um, where they, they mush the biofilm between two electrodes. Um, and then they can attach, those cells are essentially batteries. So they can attach those cells in, in, um, in series. And then right in, when you attach things in series, then you get like uh, more voltage out of, out of that scenario. <laughs> yeah. And I think they also did some things where they tested it in salt water as well. Cause, that, mm -hmm. because well, one of the things people, I was gonna say our, our sweat is salty, <laughs> so like yeah, right? so, yeah, yeah, that's the main thing they're focusing on. The idea that we we could have wearable devices that are powered by us somehow, and mm -hmm. one of the ways is sweat, mm -hmm. which again, yeah, like we generate the moisture and and we also generate heat, right? And that heat is evaporating water off of our bodies. There's energy there to be captured, so to speak, and so this device what they imagine for this device is that that like those that low amount of energy that's just created by us living right our regular old uh, life I, you know this makes me think of um in in like energy generation there's something like cogeneration like power plants that make steam they can be used to power electrical turbines but also the steam itself can be used to heat houses Right. And like, that's the same thing. Our, our bodies are alive, metabolizing sugars in order to like keep our temperature and our body at a certain state. But like we could create a device that latches onto that. And like in the process of just us living, we also generate a bit of current that can power some interesting devices. And, and they do actually power some test devices here. Um, they create like something that uh, can uh, glucose, I think, right? Glucose is one of yeah. the things they look at. Um, and oh, a strain sensor. So like, just like, oh, like, is is this bending or not? <laughs> that, that kind of is what sets this this ab above other papers because I think that the, they demonstrate the practical uses of it. Because I think for a lot of these, you can say, oh, this will generates energy, but it's usually like either so small it's not for practical use, or mm -hmm. it's something that would only theoretically work in a lab situation. But I think this really strengthens it where they literally put it on someone and say, hey, let's actually power a device. And then yeah. suddenly the leap to this actually becoming something that happens in the real world is becomes that much smaller. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it doesn't really tell us all, like this paper isn't about telling us like why this phenomena works or like diving into those mechanistic parts, but it's giving us more of a concrete, like this is something you could do with this. <laughs> I, I assume it's targeted for people who already know how this works because yeah. I think that's kind of an ad advanced level of physics that I never really, uh, that I'm not aware of. Uh huh. Because uh, the way I'm imagining it is probably the most simplistic way is like, oh, you know how when you rub something and you get static electricity? It's like that, but water molecules are doing that, and that's probably completely inaccurate. <laughs> that's what's getting you through the day with this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I guess I, the reason why I wanted to say it that way is because like, I also want to highlight like, but the paper could have gone in a direction too where it's saying like, 
why are these biofilms doing better than some of the other materials that are out there? And then in doing that, then we're talking about like, well, how can we change the growth of the biofilms to be more optimal, right? Like that information would just be useful in another part of the process to make these objects. Instead, the paper focuses on like, what are the objects that can be made, right? With, 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 the, with the technology at play. So I just wanted to like sort of highlight yeah. that distinction. <laughs> I think that's an important distinction because that helps us to segue into the next paper, which is on a similar thing, but it does delve into a lot more into the processes of how things work. Yes, and uh, and consequently, it also gives us a lot more physics, which, which we might not be able to pierce uh, as readily. Yeah. So this is going to be a very surface level interpretation of what's going on here. So the title of the paper is Microbial Biofilms as Living Photoconductors Due to Ultrafast Electron Transfer in Cytochrome Om C S Nanowires. Mm -hmm. So... We, again, we're looking at the same bacteria, Geobacter sulfuridescens, and this one focuses more into like the structure of the, those biofilms. So we yeah. mentioned earlier those biofilms have a lot of cytochrome in them. So cytochrome is kind of one, it's a main, like, uh, it's a big player in the respiratory transport chain. It mm -hmm. helps to like transfer electrons. And in this case, it's a for, for part of those biofilms where it helps to transfer electrons between the bacteria that yep. are living in this situation. Absolutely. Actually, the funny thing is, is back in, I, or one thing that this paper reminded me of as I was reading through the introduction is when the first reports of these like bacterial nanowires came out, the, the, the first thought that went through, I guess, like, um, the, the minds of scientists is like, oh, like wire-like structures and bacteria, those are pili. <laughs> and like, we're like, oh, that, it must be this, right? All these pillin genes, like they make these long pili and the pili are conductive. But then as they investigated further, they were actually like, well, these fibers are, yeah, there are pili, but there's also like fibers just made of cytochromes <laughs> that are kind of mashed together. And so that's like kind of fascinating as well, right? Or like the pili being embedded with cytochromes. Um, and, and yeah, so this material is, I guess, in some ways that's still being understood and, and taken apart. Like what are all the molecules that go into uh, letting these biofilms have the properties that, that we're interested in? Um, and, and just before we go any further, I wanted to say that this paper though is looking at another uh, mechanism of making energy. So like we were looking, in the last one we were looking at energy making from evaporation off the surface, but here the phenomena is different. It's like, energy that you get when you shine light on something. <laughs> yeah, so there's going to be a lot of talk about excitation states. So when mm -hmm. when light can hit like an electron orbital, it can excite the electron into a certain place. If there's res so light kind of uh, is resonant. So if if they're singing the same tune, it gets louder. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the electron is at the same kind of frequency as the the light, they can they can interfere with each other cuz electromagnetic radiation and then the electrons can become much can take up some of that energy and then pass on to other electrons. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the a photoconductive effect. So yeah. sometimes like, especially if like electrons aren't conduct, are like, yeah, so again, limit of my like knowledge here. Um, <laughs> but, but no, but that's, but yeah, like that's, that's the main tool that they're using in this paper is that they have lots of different ways of uh, getting the light to, uh, yeah, of controlling what light is being shone <laughs> on these particular structures and then ways of measuring like what how the electrons are moving in response to that light being added. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the idea is I think look at the point, cytochromes have these things called heme groups inside them. So the same thing mm -hmm. that you just kind of see in red blood cells where they contain iron and iron has all these electrons that can be used to transmit kind of electrons or charge, I think, is the right term, because I'm not necessarily sure whether the electrons themselves move around a lot, but I think like the idea is that energy can go, go through them. And mm -hmm. they test them using uh, lasers. Always fun to have lasers playing on <laughs> things. And then they um, uh, looked at, look at like kind of the effect of like adding light on this, on how well these th these uh, what nanowires conduct ele electricity. Yeah, and, and they use yeah, and, and it's about this paper is about this mechanism. So like it's trying to give us, I guess, the physical description of what's going on with the electrons when the lights are shine, when, when the lasers are irradiated on it. Um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it just opens up the thought of like using these biofilms as some sort of um, like almost like a, 
a solar cell, I guess, right? It's like, it's like, right? Like, it's like, how do we make electricity now from light uh, on these surfaces? Um, and I guess what was interesting to me is where they, I think they work with like cytochrome deletion mutants in this one. So they, they see for the presence of cytochrome or no cytochrome in the system. Is that, do you remember if yeah, they did that? I think they look for the effects of like, say, the components of the cytochromes. Yeah. And, and see what, how that has an effect. Because I think the first thing, they, the first principle they start with like these nanowires that were like, Kind of evolutionary evolve specific. So I think they did some extra, like, kind of mani mani manipulation to make them more better at charge conduction. So mm -hmm. they're kind of working back and breaking down why this is happening. Um, and I think this is like a big part in trying to understand the electrical properties of these these nanowires. Mm -hmm. So it's not. So yeah, I think it could be useful in solar cells. They also mentioned how it could be useful in kind of in chemical reactions that, that they could facilitate using these. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing is to know this to know this so that we can build on because it helps us understand the the overall like electrical properties of this mm -hmm. yeah actually i'm not sure if they maybe i'm like confusing this with another paper that i was reading but they don't i don't think they're removing cytochromes from this they need they need cytochromes to make this effect yeah, happen they need it. i think they just uh, yeah <clears throat> they're they just trying to find out the mechanism for how how mm -hmm. it works so, mm -hmm. so I think there is a lot of like physics here, and <laughs> um, a, a lot. Yeah, so, and that's uh, that. That's where our coverage ends. <laughs> yeah, that's where our coverage of the uh, electrical bacteria ends. Um, <laughs> so the next thing we have up is uh, this Beetle's paper: morphological adaptation for ectosymbiont maintenance and transmission during metamorphosis in Lagria beetles. So ectosymbiont meaning like on the outside of the body instead of on the inside. Um, and I guess this is known inside of the insect world that uh, insects have their own, well actually, it's known everywhere, right? We all have our own microbiota. <laughs> uh, that could be on the inside or on the outside. Um, in this case, we're talking about on the outside of the cells, um, or the outside of the body. And uh, they noticed that in this one species of beetle um, that uh, in the different uh, in the different evo in evolution states in the different metamorphic states like this is one that goes from like a larva into like a beetle with a hard shell and wings or whatever uh, there's uh, there's a there's a sexual dimorphism difference in the males and the females having a particular symbiote associated with them um, and so they want to dive into the reason by looking at uh, sections of these bugs and staining them to see what cells are there. Um, yeah, what's the physiologic reason? What's the zone, I guess, the body part that might be governing this? Because the beetles do, I guess, the males and the females, they do look different uh, at some level. And they also have two different beetles, the same family or same genus, right, different species. Um, and they're going to look at both of them to try to figure out uh, yeah, where the bacteria live on them and how that location changes from the larva to the adult. <laughs> yeah, so they've got this like 3D image where they kind of highlight that these endosymbionts live in, I think, these three organs that are mm -hmm. kind of on the dorsal side of the pupa. And, and the idea is that, because I think when you're a caterpillar, you've got these endosymbionts that you use for various functions. Mm -hmm. and they need trans. You need to somehow find a way for those endosymbionts to end up in the adult. But since like all the organs are moving around, how do you end make sure that they're in the right places? Right? <laughs> um, yeah, and they're because I think like for some like animals, like the males don't eat, so they don't need the endosymbionts. So there might be some sexual dimorphism going on there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the same might be happening with these. Uh, yeah, animals. and also I feel like. Uh, another part of this study is trying to understand, so like they have these symbiotes that are existing on the outside of the body, but then how do they also get uh, transferred down to the progeny? <laughs> do they have to like pick them up from the environment again, or is it like they get seeded from the mothers and whatever? Um, and I think that that's like, actually that's the mystery that this paper sort of unfolds, is that they talk about these structures on the surface uh, that, hold the, that hold the bacteria, but um, they still are sort of they they're still they still don't know like how they might get passed down from those structures onto the the eggs of of the of the 
of the of the larva. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they do some interesting experiments here where they actually like take some beads that are t that are kind of tagged fluorescently and they put it into those organs and then mm -hmm. they try and see how where they end up at the end of like um the at, at the end points yeah um, absolutely like uh because in the adult form they're in these specific organs so they're saying like how do they get into those organs uh, and I guess because they end up using beads in this in this circumstance, that means it's just like the shape, the developmental shape of things, right? There's no, it's not necessary to have some specialized, you know, associations with those surfaces. It's enough that like, oh, if you're covered in a certain bacteria, then in the process of those develop in in the process of becoming a pupa and developing into the adult, the the things on the surface will get enclosed into these tiny little spaces. And then I guess at that point, you know, if you're able to grow in that space, then that that's that's what leads to the colonization of, of these specialized organs. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and I think they've got like a little diagram that shows like kind of the the process where where like through the emergence of the of the like adult from the pupa. Mm -hmm. kind of, like the symbionts kind of spread onto the surface of the adult and they end up in in the niches where they need to be mm -hmm. uh, somehow mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really it's kind of it's fascinating to think because like we don't i guess we i'm trying to think of like the weird part of the the human analogy here right like because we have a microbiota too that's like and we have presumably these endosymbionts right that like are doing stuff with us um, but like our body forms don't change as dramatically <laughs> as mm. these metamorph metamorphizing insects, right? They, uh, they're just like slug things <laughs> that then like, they got like wings and like legs and stuff in a, in a way that we don't see. Um, yeah, it's just interesting to think about how in this world, you know, like there's all these other considerations for how do you get the bacteria in the right place? <laughs> it's, it's like being born twice essentially because like, there is that like thing of like how do you get the microbiome from the mum to the yeah. early child now it's like the mother in this case is a pupa and yeah <laughs> so it's you know that's that still kind of is the absolutely and it, absolutely <clears throat> it's always kind of bonkers to look at like microbiomes in other animals because they can be so interesting when you yeah like this. i mean other animals are so different from us and so like the microbes that uh evolve with them like deal with a totally different set of environmental circumstances um but yeah i thought this was really cool it's nice to see some pictures of bugs and things uh, and just just again to know that like in some insects or in some organisms there are very specific spots where um uh the the microbes are that that are important for their lifestyle <clears throat> Take us to the next uh, paper, mm -hmm. which is transcontinental dispersal of non-endemic fungal pathogens through woodland handicraft imports. <laughs> yeah, this paper is a. Uh, I guess it's almost like a like a outbreak type <laughs> style paper, where it's like where where are certain pat where could certain pathogens come from, and they're focusing on. There's a lot of interplay here with like policy, import export policy. Uh, because they talk about like, you know, there's different categories of things that get imported and exported and you can have a different designation for like if you're allowed to import without permit or something. Do you have to do certain cleaning steps before you import certain things? Because like we don't, this is like the challenge of the globalized world as we've seen with human outbreaks, right? But it also extends into like um, uh, plant right into the plant war like especially when you think of our agriculture system it has like some vulnerabilities in it in in the sense of like monoculture and all this type of stuff like people don't want like an outbreak of a really bad uh disease causing organism uh even just for like our in or uh not non-human lives right but that are still important for our infrastructure um so yeah so they take an approach here uh where they're m monitoring i think they they say it's built out of undergraduate research, this yeah. paper. Um, that, that's quite mm -hmm. interesting, because it is literally is an undergraduate project where they got a bunch of students to go, and they bought some products from stores, uh, uh -huh. sourced from different countries, and then they, like, took samples from them and also just put them into, like, a really humid environment and saw what yep. fungi grew out. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so uh, essentially what they're saying is they've captured a snapshot of like what's happening in this in this trade of fancy wood hand fancy wood imports, right? Like um so the, these are consumer products, right? Like maybe like a nice bowl or a decorative object that you put in your home. Uh sometimes that wood comes from overseas, so they take a snapshot of that by buying things in the store and they're saying what grows in them and are those things uh, where do where where do those things come from? Did they come from like in transit? Have they been seen in the environment that we're bringing these pieces of wood? Um, yeah, and so the yeah, I guess the images they talk a lot about cutting bowls up, <laughs> right? Like in the methods, it's like oh, we cut these things in half and we put them in human containers. Uh, we saw what grew and we took like they took core samples and then they did microbiome analysis, right? It's ITS 16S. Right? Or I guess it's all ITS because they're looking at fun fungal stuff going on. Um, and uh, they they collect all that data together and they they build us this like uh, really long table. I guess they have one that's like nicely colored. The figure four is like a little bit colored. Yeah, they have all these different, um, uh, uh, cat, they categorize these things, right? Uh, the things that they find. And, and these are not things that have been documented in North America before uh, is what they is, is one of their findings. So so we are through the process of moving these wooden handicraft imports. We are moving microorganisms around. I, I mean, in some ways that seems so obvious, right? Of course, we're moving microorganisms around. But um, I think the research is trying to imply uh, like maybe there should be more stringent cleaning controls or something or like before we we move stuff around because like, uh, you know, these these fungal pathogens, uh, they actually find human ones as well. Uh, like, you know, they could be, maybe we don't want to be mixing things like this. Maybe we can't control it though, right? That's another element like that that comes out. Is there are like wood treatment protocols out there to like fumigate or like kind of in, have like things to stop this. I think this kind of, mm -hmm. and I think the, one of the things they do constantly is like clean the surface of, of this. So I think their, their kind of thoughts are maybe like the surface like there's surface decontamination, but that might not be enough. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, th that's like that's their whole thing where they like cut things open or like when they incubate things in that moist environment, things from the inside are kind of like moving to the outside or being able to fruit on the outside. Um, but yeah, so anyways, it's happening. There's all there's. I think the world is in a state where things are always shifting around. Um, having more eyes, this is almost like a surveillance type thing, right? Like it's another form of surveilling for emerging pathogens is that these data sets will be like, well, how, when something emerges and causes disease, we'll say, well, where did it come from? Well, maybe it could have come from like some wood that we imported from one place to another. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think one of the yeah. things they tried to point out is like there are a lot of thermotolerant and halotolerant bacteria. So they they think that the current treatment strategies are doing some things, just not doing enough. Uh -huh. And right. also I kind of right. think it's kind of, it'd be kind of nice if they put the names of the undergrad students in the acknowledgements at least. Uh, it feels yeah. Like, it feels <laughs> not great that they that those names were left out because these people did do the work. And yeah, the work. you might not want to give them an author credit, but if, yeah. Um, but yeah. That's... I I agree I agree <laughs> it, it 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 took a lot of work to do this and it, you know it would have been nice to see that uh, the other one thing I want to say before we move off is this also reminds me of a paper about finding candida auris on apples yeah. <laughs> that we had like sort of picked up a while ago in a news episode right but just this idea that like you know we we move a lot of product around the world for for different reasons and uh, microbes come come with them. <laughs> All right. So up next, we have uh, drivers and determinants of strain dynamics. Um, oh my gosh, it's kind of, uh, following fecal microbiota, microbiota transplantation. <laughs> yeah. So my, so fecal microbiota translation, sorry, transplantation is basically like where you drink someone else's microbiota. It usually happens after like a disease. So just just like, sipping, if, sipping on someone else's microbiota. Yeah, you're just gonna. <laughs> We're not going to talk about how it might be derived from food. We just go like, okay, right. So we've got each got a microbiome, and if one person, if you're having like, so there's been a lot of studies on like whether fecal, fecal micro, 
FMT, they call it. <laughs> for micro biofluid transplantation. FMT, we're going to call it that because I keep tripping over the words. Um, <laughs> but it's a, often a thumb, uh, uh, an intervention for inflammatory diseases. So, mm -hmm. uh, thing, so ways to like kind of treat certain diseases. I mean, one of the most famous ones is like clostridial diseases, where yep. you have to use a huge amount of antibiotics, and then you need to replace the microbiome. And then uh, FMT is one way to to re do that replacement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, they even paper here. They uh, they shorten for they shorten that because it's quite important. Recurrent clostridial difficile infection or CDI, yeah. recurrent CDI. <laughs> yeah, recurrent CDI. So that's when you get because when you use antibiotics, clostridia can like form spores and they come mm -hmm. back afterwards and it's not good. Yeah. So having microbiome there that can outcompete clostridia is very good. Mm -hmm. Um. And here we're essentially looking at the, the concept is like what happens when you have like this foreign microbiota coming in to the re to resin. What happens? Do they fight? Who mm -hmm. comes out on top? Who like doesn't? Yeah. Um. um and and, yeah. How do they mix? And what causes things, certain things to happen? Right. Um, and they're doing that. The approach that they're taking here is a is a meta study essentially. Yeah. That they're they're collecting like a whole bunch of different data sets where they have samples from before fecal microbiota transplant and after fecal mi microbiota transplant and they're saying what are the factors can we predict can we predict uh using this data set some things that are important the f important factors uh that might uh tell us what bacteria will grow or what bacteria won't grow both from the transplant and from what's existing in the in the person and already <clears throat> yeah and they they kind of like look through it's, it's a really broad variety of studies so it's not just like rcdi with clostridium difficile they mm -hmm. look at things like crohn's disease they look at um melanoma yeah look at tourette syndrome they use various other like other sorts of uh disease. so there's a really broad like kind of pool of donors and recipients mm -hmm. and what they tend to find is that the most important thing is that the the state of the environment of the recipient. So, um, the, the microbiome that are already there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there are some like species of bacteria that tend to be a lot more resilient to this, um, and they find that that it's very rare we get, uh, say, a a donor like microbiome either taking over completely or being completely rejected. It's usually yeah. on a spectrum mm -hmm. of different outcomes. Mm -hmm. And and they have a they have a hypothesis that they're trying to work with this understand or this thought that there might be the best donor like if we could just find the perfect microbiota that to transplant then that microbiota is the one that we can standardize across the board right and then this will help like improve the efficacy of uh, FMT uh, so by finding by 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 doing this analysis and finding information that says it's based on the a lot of the factors are based on the receiver it kind of it it, it uh, it, it debunks to some level, or at least uh, put cast more doubt on the on the on the hypo on the hypothetical scenario where there's a perfect donor microbiome. <clears throat> yeah, I think it really mm -hmm. puts out the idea the, that there is a lot of variability in the recipients, and mm -hmm. that there is a lot of situations there that kind of the microbiome fits the environment it's in, yep. rather than the microbiome I I inflicting a new kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, environment on mm -hmm. um, and we've talked a uh, little bit in in actually I think last week I, I picked out a paper about um, mouse mice uh, a mouse model for diarrhea and how like the type 6 secretion system like is part of the competition between microbes right that says which one's gonna take over if they get gavaged with one or the other and then consequently whether or not like they'll be resistant to <laughs> getting this diarrhea in the model and so that is part of the mechanistic evidence that would flow into these sort of more high level observations about factors, right? Building up our understanding of like, like, yeah, what are, like what underlies this idea of, um, this idea of uh, recipient related factors, right? And uh, at the molecular level, it could be in part, right? This, uh, the type six secretion stuff and, and uh, sort of competition between bacteria shooting proteins into each other. <laughs> they do actually look into that. So they've got this, they, 
So they're all, so well that that's a broad strokes and in the like small strokes they talk about gatekeeper species which mm. inhibits donor strain and harassment. So mm-hmm. the they find that like very some species that are kind of conspecific so they're related to each other can uh, re- resist. So if you've got yep. so in those sorts of situations it does seem like when when bacteria that occupy the same niche are using kind of type six secretion systems to fight for it, I do feel mm-hmm. it does feel like. But if there's a strain already in, like, kind of there in the recipient, they can, like, kind of inhibit donor strains that are sim- similar. And they found this a lot yeah. with bacteria doites, where I think we did talk about, I think, previous ones, where they do have a lot of, kind of, um, those uh, chemicals that bacteria produce to fight each other. I think lantibiotic yeah. bacteria license, I can't remember the exact term. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, yeah, and then and then also you add to that that, like right like this is this high level but then underneath it i feel like we've talked about many examples like we've also talked about whether or not the bacteria can induce an immune response in us right then then we fight off certain things right like that that that's another way that bacteria kind of like say like only i can be here and then yeah that's a really good thing to pull out like they they call them gatekeeper species here and then we can think about gatekeeper species as this whole list of uh, different papers that are out there talking about like the 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 specific mechanisms that a, a species may use to to restrict another one from moving into its niche yeah I mean, <laughs> if you want to like get really because i know there's been lots of studies about how like microbiome affects certain aspects i think that this doesn't debunk those but i think it like adds another low layer of complexity there um yeah yeah I think, uh, the idea that you can like drink a whole load of like yakult and lose lots of weight i think that it's a lot more complicated <laughs> than that and there are like <laughs> It's not you're not going to be able to swap out your entire back microbiome completely because there are some there is a reason why yeah. the microbiome is the way it is at this point, but you can mm-hmm. update mm-hmm. it or ch- it does shift and they can to some extent like predict that there will be a shift, but it's not a perfect prediction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so moving on, um, mm. we've got history dependent physiological adaptation to lethal genetic modification under antibiotic exposure. Um, so this, this paper I find quite fascinating because, uh, well, first of all, it's using a piece of technology called the mother machine, (laughs) something I think around maybe 2010, this, this observed, and it's a essentially tiny channels made is a microfluidic device where there's tiny channels that at the bottom of the channel, there's a mother cell, one bacterial cell. And, uh, it, and media is flowing through uh, a central channel that's sort of like, all the new cells that kind of move to the the mouth of that channel get flown away. <laughs> so you get to see uh, sort of um, a pop a single from a single cell the population of cells that grow from that single cell um, over a course of time, and you can change the media up to sort of uh, do different conditions. Or in this case, they also are able to use light to do genetic modifications to those bacteria as they're growing in the mother machine. Uh, And the reason why they're bringing all these tools together is because they want to know, um, like some, they want to know a little bit about uh, antibiotic resistance. Specifically, what if you don't have the antibiotic resistance gene, but you still somehow become tolerant to that to to that antibiotic? Um, And this is like a field. This is like a, a part of antibiotic resistance that people talk about. Persisters is like one of the phenomena that exist in this area where just if you just use antibiotics against you know susceptible bacteria sometimes there are some a few bacteria that stick around and then when they grow up maybe they pick up the mutations for antibiotic resistance or sometimes they just never have but somehow they survived <laughs> um, and and this paper is trying to interrogate i guess um i mean they're being very quantitative about it in in, in many ways they're looking at whether or not when they at what point do, uh, do, does resistance? At what point can they remove, make the genetic lesion for for on on the resistance gene and still see things that survive? Um, and so maybe that's easier if I tell an example or like I tell the main find or yeah, the, the mean, main finding here. So like this, yeah. Oh, go go ahead. This is just like this, I mean, some technology is amazing. So they got this like gene that they can shut off using light. Uh, so they mm-hmm. got, so they've got this like. Like so that, that's the resistance gene. Yeah, yeah the resistance gene is going to be controlled in this way. Yeah. So they've got like, <clears> these, this blue light, like kind of 
like sensitivity where like if you, you shine blue light on it, it kind of comes together and then it shuts down the gene. Uh, so, mm-hmm. and so that's what we kind of seeing in this first like video where you, you seeing that at some point they flash a light and this red represents a resistance gene. And once that light flashes, it stops producing the, the gene and that then disappears. Mm-hmm. And that resistance mm-hmm. gene is for chloramphenicol, which hits up the ribosome, right? Um, so the ribosome, yep. it, the ribosome like makes proteins based off of the, the template DNA and mm-hmm. RNA. And uh, it's, for, it's got two sections. One's a 50S and one's a 30S. And, and this is great because they actually like get here. You can actually see the, how the spell reacts to the, um, the removal of the resist, resistance gene uh, very quickly. Um, Mm-hmm. So they, yeah, so in, in, in the presence, so they, they of course test the system to say, oh, they can turn off this gene, and if there's no antibiotic, nothing changes. The cells are fine, right? Like, because there's no pressure. But if they turn off that gene and there is antibiotic around, then the cells slowly stop to grow, stop growing. <clears throat> Um, but the weird, the weird observation that they find, which is driving, driving this study, is um, because the mother machine just has like a bunch of individual cells essentially in their own little trough, <laughs> uh, you get to see dynamics that you might not normally see. You can see that, oh, in some percentage of these troughs, the cells are still going, right? Meaning that there was some adaptation inside of the, the mother cell in that trough that's leading to some uh, some uh, ability to continue growing. And uh, because they did this uh, irradiation that uh, causes the gene to be uh, cut out, it's not coming from the resistance gene. So it's not like the specialized, uh, I think it's a protein in this case, a protein that inactivates chloramphenicol. Something else is happening in those cells that lets them survive. Not all cells go through this process, right? Like most things die, but there's some percentage of them that stick around. And they call that physiologic adaptation. So saying that like things inside of the cytoplasm can just adjust, like maybe some RNAs can, you know, start making something else or get segregated in a certain way. Um, yeah, so it's stuff that's not in the coded in the genome that is leading to this ability to survive. <laughs> and they, I believe they, so, uh, so, uh, they, so they tag like the ribosomes to, to like fit to like mm-hmm. look at that. So I'm going to like skip to yep. those videos because it's, yeah, so. They try to, yeah, because like the big question is then what is doing this? I don't think, I wouldn't say that this paper like sort of like closes the case on that, but they start asking the question, like maybe it's the ratio of proteins that is, the ratio of ribosome proteins that somehow is is changing this. So they have a tag for like, um, they have two tags, one for one of the ribosome subunits and one for the other. And they see that when they do the the shock to the system, when they remove, they make that deletion, that ratio gets changed. Um, uh, but over time, it recovers just a little bit in in that subset of cells that are surviving the deletion of the chloramphenicol gene. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, in these videos, you've been seeing like that it starts off with yellow uh, because the <laughs> what the ribosome that's affected by the the antibody the antibiotic is tagged red and the ribosome that isn't is tagged in in green so together they become yellow and so what happens mm-hmm. when you suddenly remove the resistance gene is that it overproduces the ribosome that's affected to almost swamp the antibiotic mm-hmm. and so that's why it turns red mm-hmm. and then the, in the ones that survive it kind of ends up shifting back towards yellow once it figures out once they derive to find a way to resist it so you right here right now what you're lo- watching is persistence and resistance evolving in almost real time yeah but it's not it's like it's it's interesting like the that that that's that that word evolution in this context it's like it's not a genetic encoding right it's not that um it's not that the genes changed and and they're really careful about that in this paper right they like look at the cells that come out of the mother machine like the ones that are growing and like kind of being um uh, swept away by the media they look at those cells and they sequence them and they see it's not that there's compensating mutations that are emerging inside of the genomes of these organisms it's actually just their their physiologic response the interaction within the cytoplasm at the moment of this happening um, and it 
it is somehow a, it is probably related, and, and they say this in the paper, probably related to the fact that there's still protein around after the deletion happens, right? And and they look at a very time, they sort of like they change the time distance, right? Like if they delete the the chloramphenicol gene, like before the experiment even begins, right? Like before they've loaded up the mother machine, they just start with like chloramphenicol de deleted things. Those don't have a chance to, to grow back, right? They just never grow at the beginning. But it's only in this in this time period where, and there is like a specific time period where they're able to, I guess, build up a few of these resistance genes, hold on for those few seconds, right? Or I don't know, seconds or whatever, hold on for those moments, right? That lets them, make some adaptation within the cytoplasm that then they can uh, return back to normal growth rates after, yeah, it, even in the presence of antibiotics without and, and not possessing like a specific way of, of neutralizing that antibiotic. Um, so, so yeah, so again, trying to link back to, I first opened with why it's important and I'll say it again, it's like this sort of this sort of observation is really interesting because like we want to know where resistance is coming from and how it's being generated because there's all these little instances where like bacterial cells are holding on despite our best efforts to get rid of them. Um, and understanding more of that mechanism might give us better insight into maybe other molecules that we can use to disrupt uh, antibiotic resistance that you know aren't antibiotics themselves. Um, or yeah, or just understanding like the, the, the way that we uh, give antibiotics as regimens, uh, what like has better outcomes, right? How do we balance those factors of like, you know, um, making sure we're not, uh, yeah, making sure we're not giving bacteria the chance to, to develop more long-term resistance. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's all I can say about that paper. Cool. The next so moving on to our next and last, uh, not really a, like a primary research document, but more of a, a overarching commentary on things. This one's called Steps to Avoid Overuse and Misuse of Machine Learning in Clinical Research. Yeah, so this has been quite a bit of a bugbear for, for me. Like anybody who's been working it. So I, used to, so I used to work in an engineering journal. And my, since my background is in like microbiology, any time something came up with a COVID-19 paper, it instantly like kind of set my like radar up. Oh, what's this about? This could be interesting. And I I cannot express the amount of disappointment to to tell you about how like so many papers on machine learning. In fact, uh, I think we covered this in a in a previous uh, session where um, I think 80% of all COVID-19 preprints end up going into archives. And they're all physics papers, mm -hmm. they're all on AI machine learning. And nearly all of them were about, I, let, let me tell you about the structure. It's like, okay, we've got some pay, pictures of COVID-19 infected lungs. We've run it through a machine learning algorithm and we think we can predict whether uh, this patient has COVID-19 or not based on the way these lung images look. And thousands, mm -hmm. hundreds, and I was managing a computer vision journal where they just had to reject a bunch of these because uh, of the reasons that will come up in here, because uh, machine learning is touching all of like research because it's it's very useful. There are lots of like applications yeah. for it, but we have to be careful of how it's applied, and that's why I kind of brought this not only because of my rage at, at the amount of <laughs> research about about machine learning that that doesn't really have any practical purpose. Um, so I think let me yeah. show you like some of the interesting like we've we've. Yeah. I just want to say, like, we've we've gotten excited about machine learning on this channel, right? We've picked out papers where they've used machine learning to sift through data sets and find relationships between things that maybe wouldn't have been easily found uh, without the use of machine learning. Um, but, you know, something I think that this paper is highlighting and something that you're expressing right now in terms of frustration is, like, is machine learning always the right solution to sift through that data? Um, and when when does machine learning give us results that aren't very useful? <laughs> and uh, maybe that's happening a little bit more. Well, no, not maybe. This is happening, right? A little bit more than uh, we would want because yeah, it, there's already so much out there to sift through a bunch of things that it's like, oh, I don't even know if this algorithm is the right tool for the job. Um, yeah, that that becomes uh, very difficult for the scientific literature as a whole to sort of reconcile. Yeah. I feel like we've been on this train before with like statistical analyses, Bayesian versus frequentist. Like, it's there's like a 
there is a vein of of like scientists who kind of feel like they can. Uh, well, no, 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 I'm not going to like scrap them, but there is like this kind of <laughs> yeah. uh, barrier around like anything related to maths or physics that pe- that can be make things cast that people m- might not make turn off their critical like eye on things that they shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that's very that's that can be super relevant in machine learning because like I don't really know how to apply a machine learning model myself. So like I'm relying on someone else's expertise, but then sometimes in that process, like you forget that like, is that expertise answering the question that you, you want to ask as an investigator about your model system yeah. or, or like just the system in general. Yeah. So uh, this paper, like kind of delves into that by looking at, because this is, like looks at kind of how machine learning research is, should be structured. Like the, the problems they highlight are like things like it's sometimes it's quite hard to like there's a failure to replicate. Um, like I remember mm-hmm. this one like kind of researcher and we had this conversation about how like how like sometimes machine learning can be a black box and it can and that makes it very hard to regulate for governments because they're going oh this mach- this car behaves a certain way on this junction but will it behave a certain way if there's like a red car there instead of a green car? We don't know because we don't know what logic <laughs> is going into the system and what it's doing with that. So we can't, if we don't understand mm-hmm. how it works, we don't know how it will behave in certain situations. So one of the things that they hit here is like it, machine learning, it should be to some degree explainable. They mm-hmm. can't just be a, bl- a black box. And and also overfitting is another thing where uh, they've got a yeah. great diagram showing this, uh, the concept of overfitting where I think anybody who's like run a fitting algorithm on like Excel has had this where where you have like a, a scattered plot of data and you can ask Excel or anybody like how can you get a line that fits this data put the best and of course mm-hmm. be- the best fit is looks like a join the dots puzzle but that isn't that's imagining a world where there isn't variance and with machine learning yeah. you can get a machine to kind of create something but you don't necessarily know whether that fit is accurate or not so here they kind of describe how they've got like a model with that is best estimated or one that like can, that, that sine wave model that can like get all the all the dots within a certain air region away from that so mm-hmm. um but yeah well i mean you imagine it like with this high variance fit Right or the the model with high variance that does the overfit, right? Like that that model, like that might not be so generalizable because because if you set a new set of dots ahead of it, right, it's gonna give you something that's like very different. Like the prediction is gonna be really different than something that again, like talking about what the best tool is, like the most simple tool we have to fit things is like just a linear regression, right? So going into ML to do this, like you have to, the authors are are advocating, right? To be very hypervigilant, right? To make sure that this isn't happening in your data sets, because if it does, it produces results that will not be reproducible later on and not generalizable, which is really like at the core of of science is that we don't just want to describe like the one experiment that we've created in front of us in in a paper. We want to be able to take those principles and then apply them to other systems and make predictions in other places. So yeah, so ML has this uh, danger. I mean, any fitting really has this danger, but like the the authors are trying to point it specifically here in machine learning that you can create these amazing uh, fits right that have all these great statistics associated with like the the algorithm and how it matches the data, but that might not help us understand the world around us because it's it's so specific for just that one set that is inside of our experimental conditions. <laughs> yeah, um, and they kind of give like a, a kind of a pointer on like things that we should should do to make sure that AI doesn't get overused, and also like things that we should maybe look for when we're look, reading AI papers to see whether. Like they've been compared with other statistical analysis analyses, where mm-hmm. they've been properly peer reviewed by people who might understand AI. Um, that's <laughs> quite a challenge because if you all say work in a microbiology journal, a lot of people work on that might not necessarily have that AI experience. So you have to almost like if you're running a journal, you have to reach out to people who who might be busy with other stuff. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. uh, having yeah. a, a version of the script available that people can run on their own and kind of test till breakage uh, to find the limits of the algorithm Mm -hmm. Um, and things Mm -hmm. like sources of bias sources of bias is a real big thing for machine learning because 
the whole garbage in, garbage out sort of. Uh, I mean, I remember hearing like mm -hmm. a story from someone who was running a games company about uh, how they. I think no, this was actually for I think Amazon. I'm not quite sure, but a big faceless corporation <laughs> tried to do this. That the way yeah. they tried to do machine learning to crunching find numbers to screen CVs to find. So they looked, put in all the CVs of all the people who work for the company, and then they taught the machine learning algorithm to like try and recognize what a success makes a successful candidate. And so, and and they they took this algorithm and they tested that on people applying to, to it, and they kind of noticed that something. Song was right in the fact that it tended to not like girls' names at all, or because the company ah, already had mm -hmm, this agenda bias. Mm -hmm. So, the, and you get that sort of bias in yeah. machine machines. They're not like they they only know what you tell them to to know, and so they mm -hmm. there has to be that kind of recognition that there is some bias going on. And same yeah i think i was in for like x-ray images where like if you've got a small sample of say one specific body type or a variety and so then then you might end up with a machine learning algorithm that just knows how to tell patients who who are like i don't know have uh tell patients who go to hit the gym too much that they have covid because that's what they recognize from the machine learning algorithms right from the right original images so <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, it's. I think it's a. It's nice and short, actually. I think it's a really good overview, especially if people don't know a lot about machine learning, just to get a sense of like what it, what what you might look for when you are reading something that has a claim associated with machine learning. How might you uh, evaluate the strength of that claim? And I think that it's really great. This this commentary is really great for that. And and one other thing that I want to say is. Um, it also just reminds me of just in general talk about statistics and how to interpret that against data, right? We talk about like p values and like an obsession sometimes of looking at like breakpoints and and statistical metrics in order to build significance. But I mean, on this channel, I think we also talk a lot about like where we think things are significant or not. And like rarely have we ever talked about like some statistical like cutoff when we're evaluating things. We look at other ways the experiments are done, right? Other lines of evidence, things that we've seen in the literature and stuff to try to make those those judgment calls. Um, so I think this is a, also a really nice uh, complement to, to that line of thinking, right? Where uh, it's not, yeah, like, it's statistics is a really useful tool to try to like uh, determine uh, relationships between things, but it's also not the only way in which that we come to understand, uh, yeah, that the the world and how it's supposed to work. <laughs> yeah, I also like I want to highlight that sometimes it's very easy to end up worshiping technology, especially if like <laughs> like you're like me and you get really excited about science and like seeing the word machine learning. Uh, is just like and it kind of like a moment where I turn my brain off, and <laughs> that's something that you, that it's sometimes it can't be helped, but also it's good to have this kind of hedge there where you kind of know that it's not perfect and that there might be something else going on there. Um, mm -hmm. And rather than just like if you, because I have this problem with like people who there is like organizations that generate fake papers, and there's been a trend recently of mm. of like organ of like people signing up special issues about machine learning or big data and editors at those journals, they don't know what machine data are. They're like working on biology, medicine, or what, what have you, but they kind of expect that someone who comes in talking about this knows what they're talking about. And then the, and they end up passing papers that are very, that look legit if you know nothing about machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's these sorts of like gaps in, in like kind of our critical eye that, that we need to keep an eye on because- Absolutely. And, yeah, it's something that, I mean, literally, like, we just talked about physics papers, and we don't know that. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. could be completely true. wrong about that. I mean, that wearable <laughs> technology could have been photo, blah, 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 but I don't know. Uh, we, because I think also acknowledging those instances where our critical faculties don't necessarily yeah. co give us that coverage is mm -hmm. important. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... Um, we want to tell you guys to join us next in, in, in two weeks if you want to hear more coverage like this about uh, interesting microbiology papers. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. It's been a pleasure. Apologies for the sound uh, issues. I will be editing them out, it, hopefully, <laughs> clumsily, probably. Uh, but yeah, thank you for watching this show. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Um, yeah.
Yeah. Totally. Um, if you found something unclear or uh, you want to add your own comments, like we really uh, think that peer review is this process that we're all participating in, but it really needs us to like read and participate in, in these papers. So uh, leave us a comment on Twitter or Macedon or in the comments uh, here on YouTube. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try to get back to you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so tune in in two weeks' time for more microbiology content. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Bye. Stay here.